Welcome to Amazing Graves, where together, we'll discover the ways cemeteries can unlock the incredible history that surrounds us. I'm Dr. Thomas Henthorne, wide endowed professor of public history at the University of Michigan Flint. And today, we're back at Old Calvary Catholic Cemetery in Flint. Old Calvary was created in 1847 by parishioners from St. Michael's Catholic Church. And for 1847, it was really ahead of its time. We're about two miles from the center of downtown Flint, at the edge of the city's current boundaries. But let's wind the clock back about 175 years and imagine what this patch of land would have looked like. We would have been well outside the developed areas of Flint. In fact, when this cemetery began, Flint wasn't even a city yet. It was an oversized town that consisted mostly of wood frame buildings and a few brick structures that ran along what early residents called the Saginaw Road or the Military Road. So this plot of land that St. Michael's Parish acquired was a comfortable distance beyond the city limits, but still a reasonable distance by carriage. It's bounded on two sides by natural features, a river and a gully. And while some of this land was cleared for cultivation, there were still enough natural features to give visitors that sense of nature, or at the very least, someplace not as urban as the town that was growing just to our east. If all of this sounds familiar to those of you who know their cemetery history, you may agree that St. Michael's was pretty visionary for its time. When most residents were burying their dead in the original burying ground, a few blocks from the center of town, Catholics in Flint selected a picturesque patch of land away from the welter of urban distractions where they could visit the departed and commune with the natural surroundings this place would have afforded. That was a cutting edge way to think about cemeteries in 1847 especially in a small but growing urban center in an area people were still calling the Great West. We often look to established cemeteries, like Glenwood, created 10 years later in 1857 as a rural cemetery, to demonstrate the changing attitudes about death in the 19th century. But even though we can't give it a label like rural or lawn park, it's equally important to remember those cemeteries that help us understand the intellectual and social changes that shaped our communities. And at Old Calvary, you could see how the landscape and monuments revealed the social and economic mobility Catholics achieved over 175 years. That story of how Roman Catholics became American is very well known. Beginning in the 19th century, Catholics were derided by the Protestant majority who claimed they were incompatible with America. And by the early 20th century, the anti-Catholic Ku Klux Klan was running rampant. But this changed after World War II. Jay Dolan argued that military service, educational achievement, economic advancement, and suburbanization combined to make Catholics indistinguishable from other Americans. Catholics became mainstream. There's a problem with this narrative, however, because it applies only to the children and grandchildren of European Catholic immigrants. Another story involves black Catholics, who not only took a different path, but also challenged it. Black Catholics carved down a place within their own church and within the communities they called home. In the process, they transformed what it meant to be both Black and Catholic. African Americans had been a significant influence on the Catholic Church in the Americas for a few hundred years, but the mass movement of African Americans from the rural South to the urban North and West reoriented the Church's relationship with Black Catholics and the question of race in American society. And that's what brings us to this grave, the resting place of Father Norman Duquette. Duquette's one of the few African Americans buried here at Old Calvary, and the first black priest in Michigan. Duquette's life reveals the complicated path black Catholics took to address the needs of African Americans and forge a more just community, inside and outside the church. What little scholarship there is on racial justice in Flint has focused mostly on events in the 1960s, when the tide of civil rights protests and legislation was at its peak. But Duquette's pioneering crusade reveals some early attempts that yielded some surprising results. Father Norman Duquette grew up in Washington, D.C. He arrived in Detroit about 1907, just ahead of the waves of black migrants that flowed from the southern states into the city. Duquette lived in Detroit when the city's population was nearly doubling in size every decade, thanks to the growth of the automobile industry. But Duquette didn't come to Detroit to build cars. Even while living in Washington, D.C. as a member of St. Augustine's Parish, Duquette expressed an interest in a priestly vocation. But the priesthood was just like many aspects of American life. Opportunity was circumscribed by race. 
Prior to World War II, Catholic evangelization to African Americans, like most efforts to address the needs of African Americans, took place within the confines of a segregated world. In places like Detroit, and eventually Flint, the Catholic Church made genuine attempts to address the needs of black families living in urban neighborhoods, struggling in the industrial workforce, and searching for spiritual comfort. But white Catholics never considered integrating workplaces, neighborhoods, and churches as a solution. Rather, the church chose to minister to African Americans separately, in separate schools, with separate services, and in separate churches. This approach was closely tied to the ways Catholics fused race, religion, and community. And that's exactly what black Catholics helped to change. When Duquette was working in Detroit, there had already been a significant movement building to challenge the racism within the church. Men like Daniel Rudd and Thomas Wyatt Turner were vocal critics of church policies and called out local clergy, bishops, and lay Catholics for emulating the world's racist practices and bringing them into houses of worship, a practice Daniel Rudd called the hardship he and black Catholics faced in the house of their friends. Duquette's career was shaped by this segregated vision of society and the church's complicitness in it. In 1914, while he was still a layman, Father Joseph Voost of St. Mary's on the city's east side assisted Duquette in organizing a mission for African Americans. A small group of black Catholics had been using a classroom at St. Mary's School for a chapel. But within this segregated world of worship, the white parishioners who descended from German Catholic immigrants would never have invited their co-religious to worship with them. So Duquette helped a small group of African Americans create a new faith community called St. Peter Claver Mission. This type of racism was more than just parishioners expressing bigotry. It stemmed from the church's policies that worked to separate African Americans, and restricting the priesthood to Catholics of European ancestry was a key strategy. For years, Duquette unsuccessfully applied to seminaries and religious orders so he could enter the priesthood. Despite repeated refusals, he was finally admitted to Columbia College in Dubuque, Iowa at the age of 26. And when he was ordained in 1926, he became the first African-American Catholic priest in Michigan. By the time he was ordained, Detroit's African-American population had swelled to about 120,000. But the church's commitment to segregation, like the rest of the institutions in the city, remained firm. And when there were rumblings of militancy among black Catholics in Detroit, the Chancery worked hard to quash it. Detroit's hierarchy rebuffed efforts to ordain more black priests and sent its only black priest, Father Duquette, to Flint in 1929, leaving the few black Catholic communities in the city under the charge of white priests, loyal to their orders or the hierarchy, which made any attempts at racial justice that much more difficult. When he arrived in Flint, Duquette encountered a much smaller African-American population. Out of a city of almost 160,000, Flint's African-American population was less than 5,000 in 1929, and most of those residents were concentrated in the St. John's neighborhood near the city's factory district, and later in the Floral Park neighborhood south of downtown. It's here in the former St. John neighborhood that Father Duquette began his ministry, which at first was called the Colored Catholic Mission. Urban renewal projects like this industrial park and an interstate forced residents to leave the neighborhood in the 1970s. But in 1929, the neighborhood was home to an African-American population that lived among a concentration of white families from rural Michigan and a few concentrated blocks of whites whose ties with Europe were barely severed by a generation. Without a building of his own, Father Duquette held masses for his colored Catholic mission at St. Joseph Hungarian Catholic Church, people's homes, and wherever else he could find space for his slowly growing but devoted parishioners. As the African-American population grew, Father Duquette shifted the focus of his ministry to the growing African-American population on the city's near south side, a neighborhood today we refer to as Floral Park. By 1940, Floral Park had grown to a neighborhood of about 4,000 people, almost half of whom were black. And in Floral Park, Father Duquette continued to celebrate mass in people's homes or short-term rentals until 1937, when members had enough funds to purchase their own property. The parish relocated and renovated a former National Youth Administration building to their property on Clifford Street in 1946, just in time to prepare for the surge of African Americans who flooded into Flint after World War II. 
This period from 1946 to 1960 represented an exponential growth in black residents in Flint. And by the beginning of the 1960s, one in five Flint residents identified as African-American. Yet whites restricted black residents to the same neighborhoods they had begun to occupy in the 1920s. And this combination of population growth and racial discrimination manifested itself in numerous incidents in the post-war period. Duquette's efforts to address these issues shed light on two important but underexplored subjects. First was the degree to which African Americans in Flint were plugged into the broader black freedom struggle within the Catholic Church. Secondly, that many people in Flint were earnestly looking at issues of racial justice much earlier than many scholars recognize. Father Duquette was an officer of the Detroit Federated Colored Catholics and a member of the Catholic Interracial Council in Detroit. Both organizations and their members influenced much of the church's teaching on race in the middle of the 20th century and forced the Catholic hierarchy in America to take a stand on civil rights. We often look at the 1950s and especially the 1960s as the decades when white Americans began to earnestly address racial justice within interracial organizations. But it's important to recognize the influence of grassroots organizations like the Catholic Interracial Council, who in the 1940s helped to bring the issue of race which most whites were able to keep at a comfortable distance into white institutions like the Catholic Church. And even though we don't know the total extent of Duquette's contributions, you can see how the agenda of these organizations to preserve a distinct black Catholic identity while integrating African Americans into the church and democratic society informed his efforts in Flint and linked his actions with broader attempts at making the Catholic Church and American life less of a hardship for African Americans. Another example of Father Duquette's groundbreaking civil rights work was the Interracial Center in Flint. Remember, I said that Duquette's earliest work was the St. John's neighborhood. Now by 1940, St. John's and Oak Park had the highest number of black residents in Flint. But St. John's was hardly a model of integration. There was considerable tension that existed between black residents, who made up about 40% of the neighborhood, and their white neighbors. When those tensions began to boil over at a neighborhood school among some older students, Duquette, along with other black clergy, a local banker, and philanthropist Charles Stewart Mott, stepped in to address the growing racial tension in the neighborhood. Now, Flint's bankers, industrialists, and philanthropists have a spotty record on racial justice. But when they came to the table with local black leaders and helped create the Flint Interracial Center in 1946, their experiment was truly remarkable. The Flint Interracial Center operated as a space to bring people together. Dialogue and communal activities were at the heart of the programs at the center. R. Spencer Bishop, a local banker, donated the space, and the program was almost exclusively funded by the C.S. Mott Foundation. Frank Manley, executive director of projects, oversaw the Mott Foundation's relationship with the center and the city's Parks and Recreation Division. The center was partly patterned after the community school model that the Mott Foundation funded locally in which schools operated as community centers for all residents, and not just places to educate youth. So the center offered many of the same kind of programs that other community schools and centers did in other parts of the city. Most of these centers and schools reflected and reinforced the segregation patterns in Flint. In fact, community school officials operated under a misguided theory that residential segregation offered a stable social structure that allowed local institutions to encourage community. It was the same racist assumptions that underpinned beliefs equating racially homogenous streets with orderly neighborhoods. But the interracial center was premised on bringing people of different backgrounds, races, religions together and building relationships among diverse groups. Nobody in Flint had ever seen anything like this, but black clergy like Father Duquette had been doing this kind of work for years. And Duquette favored this integrationist approach to racial justice. And Father Duquette was a regular at the interracial center. He led dialogues for a few years and sponsored interfaith discussions at the center. The center eventually closed in 1951, and the community programs at the center were dispersed to schools and new facilities built by the Flint Parks Department. Unfortunately, these programs didn't have the explicit focus of racial justice and integration. In fact, in many ways, they were a step backward, and the needs of black residents would be met within that vision of a segregated world. But the Interracial Center is sort of a contradictory blip on the radar in the discussions of structural racism in Flint. Scholars have identified the myriad of choices that converge to keep African Americans separate from white society. But many examinations of Flint have dismissed or overlooked that these same actors, 
bankers, school officials, public policymakers, philanthropists, and leaders in the local housing and labor market all came together for a short period of time in this remarkable experiment in racial integration. And while at the time the interracial center was unique in the city, Father Duquette continued to forge ahead with most of his efforts to address the disparities between black and white residents within that segregated vision of Flint. He helped to initiate the Colored Christmas Seal in Flint, an annual fundraiser to address the high numbers of African Americans infected with tuberculosis. He worked with the League of Catholic Women throughout the 1940s to gain resources for African Americans in Flint. And long before Flint residents were agitated for open housing, Father Duquette led the League of Women Voters, a mostly white organization, to talk about housing conditions and the segregated nature of Flint's neighborhoods in 1946 and again in 1948. During the 1950s, as Duquette was working hard to build the membership at Christ the King, he also sponsored an event to bring people in Flint together and pray for peace. Cold War tension between the U.S. and the Soviet Union increased during the 1950s, and many Americans lived with the anxiety of nuclear conflict. Beginning in 1951, Duquette began the Holy Hour of Peace, and the services brought together Catholics from all over the city to pray on December 30th for an end to global conflict. The event was popular enough that Duquette held it a number of times throughout the 1950s. In the 1950s, there were a handful of places where black and white residents were increasingly crossing paths, such as some workplaces and downtown, which contained the city's retail hub. But churches weren't one of them. So this is another important example of those earlier pioneering attempts at interracial cooperation. Even after Duquette turned 70, he remained a public figure in the battle for racial justice in Flint. And his stance on some issues help us to see that the March for Civil Rights was seldom in lockstep. For example, municipal government in Flint took a major step in 1960 to address racial justice in public life when it created the Human Relations Commission. This ordinance established an office within city government that would work to eliminate discrimination in the workplace, schools, and neighborhoods. But when many black clergy in this city expressed support, Duquette was weary of some of the aspects of the plan. Although age was compelling Father Duquette to slow down a bit, throughout the 1960s, Flint residents could count on his relentless support of organizations working for racial justice, like his work with the Urban League and the Civil Rights Commission, all while maintaining a high visibility as a non-white leader in a majority white institution. By the end of the 1960s, some of Duquette's efforts had paid off. Beginning in 1968, local Catholic churches made housing discrimination a key focus of social justice. Urban Catholic churches were often at the forefront of discussions about neighborhood integration, and many times it pit local pastors against a resistant laity, and there's certainly plenty of evidence of that here in Flint. But there was also a network of white priests allied with Father Duquette, such as the pastor and associate pastors of St. Agnes Parish, the pastor of Sacred Heart, and St. Luke's, who were leading their parishes in discussions about racial justice. In fact, Father James Swyatt dedicated a series of homilies here at St. Agnes to open housing in 1968, when Flint voters were deciding on a local ordinance that would outlaw discrimination in Flint's neighborhoods. In 1969, near the end of his career, Father Duquette and his parish were faced with a seemingly insurmountable obstacle. Planners had targeted the Floral Park neighborhood for demolition to make way for a new interstate interchange. And the Diocese of Lansing, which Flint was a part, wanted to integrate parishioners of Christ the King into the rest of the parishes in Flint. But Christ the King parishioners and Father Duquette made a stand and insisted that their parish shouldn't be dissolved. By this time, black Catholics in America held a different place in the church, thanks in part to the efforts of people like Father Duquette and members of Christ the King. By integrating themselves from the 1940s to the 1960s into the broader church, black Catholics demonstrated that the white ways of being Catholic were not the only ways to be Catholic. The church had always held kind of a missionary mentality when it came to black Catholics, meaning that white Catholics historically treated their black co-religious as a foreign people in need of special care rather than as full-fledged members of the church. But by 1970, African Americans had changed that and came to represent a small but significant force within the church. In a real sense, black Catholics claimed a seat at the table in the church while maintaining a distinct African American and Afro-diasporic identity. So these changes helped Christ the King parishioners to successfully challenge the diocese and move their parish to a nearby Southside neighborhood. Father Duquette stepped down as pastor of Christ the King in 1971 
and Christ the King celebrated Mass in their new home on Seymour Street a year later. It was a real win for African Americans, Flint, as their victory demonstrated it was possible for black Catholics to be, according to Cyprian Davis, both authentically black and truly Catholic. And this movement would only continue to grow in the 1980s and 1990s. Father Duquette continued to live in Flint until his death in 1980. And in the same year he died, St. Agnes renamed its grade school to Duquette Catholic School in his honor. Given his accomplishments, even though he has a longer epitaph than any other priest on St. Patrick's Circle, it doesn't really do justice to the totality of his life. So just like the grounds where he's interred, Father Duquette was ahead of his time. And you can find both of those cutting edge stories right here. Oh, <laughs>